Hello, I'm Dr. Virginia Steen from Georgetown University, and we're going to be talking today about overlapping syndromes, MCDD, UCTD, or just a lot of letters, and how these reflect on patients with scleroderma. First of all, some definitions. So an overlap syndrome is scleroderma uh, in which the patient has symptoms um, and overlap with another connective tissue disease. MCTD refers specifically to a disease called mixed connective tissue disease. And UCTD refers to undifferentiated connective tissue disease. So mixed connective tissue disease was a disease that was identified by Dr. Gordon Sharp. Uh, Dr. Sharp is now 88 years old and still participating in medicine at University of uh, Missouri. Uh, and he identified um, a protein with high uh, patients that had a protein uh, that were uh, shown to be antibodies to ribonucleic acid or U1RNP. And this was a type of ANA. And he identified a group of patients that he thought was unique, separate from scleroderma, separate from lupus, and he called them mixed connective tissue disease. This group of patients that he described had multiple features, including Raynaud's, joint pain and inflammation, arthritis. They had lots of puffiness in their fingers. They had esophageal dysmotility and they had muscle inflammation. And he thought this was a, a unique uh, group of patients that had a very specific disease that was very responsive to steroids and had a good outcome without any significant lung, kidney or nerve involvement that might have occurred in lupus. So during those early years, there was lots of confusion about what this is. Um, and so they tried to come up with different criteria. And this is the sort of the major criteria called mixed connective tissue disease, where you had to have um, um, specific um, criteria for major plus the U1RNP, or if you were probable, you could have just some of these minor criteria. And I think you can see there's a lot of the criteria that are very typical to what happens in scleroderma, swollen hands and skin thickenings, Raynaud's esophageal dysmotility, um, but also there are things that happen in lupus with low white counts and low red blood cells, um, hair loss, um, uh, lots of different things that uh, go on. Uh, and so then there was a try to come up with a simpler definition. And so this was, um, again, diagnostic criteria. You had to have synovitis or arthritis and, or myositis, plus these different issues, including swelling of the hands, joint inflammation, muscle inflammation. And again, you had to have the high definition of um, this antibody, uh, anti-U1RNP. So undifferentiated connective tissue disease are patients who have symptoms of connective tissue disease, but really don't meet any of the specific criteria. And so they may have features of scleroderma or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or myositis, but they don't fulfill all the criteria. So rather than calling them lupus or scleroderma until they sort of declare themselves, it's easier to keep an open mind for the physician and just calling them undifferentiated connective tissue disease. And overlap syndromes are patients, particularly in scleroderma, who have features of lupus or myositis or rheumatoid arthritis, but who do not have the U1 RNP antibody. And we think that this is important to clarify uh, which um, process is going on in the disease. Um, the treatments for all of these disease, as you'll hear, uh, whether you have an overlap syndrome or mixed connective tissue disease or UCTD are really focused towards the problems the individual patient has. 
So disease criteria. So when it, when you see a physician and you he re, he or she reviews all your symptoms, um, they make a diagnosis of a specific connective tissue, tissue disease based on the clinical features. But when we're doing research and clinical trials in these diseases, we need some sort of criteria. And so we've come up with um, what we call classification criteria. And so this is the set of rules that we're gonna talk about that um, a patient must have to have a classification of a specific disease. However, many patients don't fulfill the criteria and yet they still have the disease. They just need to um, not possibly participate in some of these uh, clinical trials if they don't reach uh, the full set of criteria. So in scleroderma, um, we have come up uh, as of 2013, have come up with again, a classification criteria based on a numerical weighting score, depending on your symptoms. So as in our earlier classification criteria back in 1980, um, if you have skin thickening of the fingers, as well as those proximal to the knuckles, uh, the first set of knuckles on the hands, then by definition on this classification criteria, you have scleroderma. However, many limited cutaneous scleroderma patients do not have more proximal skin thickening. And so they were excluded uh, from the early criteria. And so now this criteria includes many features that can happen in patients with limited cutaneous, just skin thickening, um, having uh, digital tip ulcers, having scars on the tips of the fingers, telangiectasias, having abnormal nail fold capillaries, having certain kinds of lung disease like pulmonary arterial hypertension or interstitial lung disease, having Raynaud's and having one of the three classic scleroderma autoantibodies, anti-centumere, anti-topoisomerase, or anti-RNA polymerase three. And this makes it much easier for patients with limited cutaneous disease to fulfill the criteria. And actually in a study that I recently did, 93% of my patients fulfilled this criteria. Um, lupus has a similar set of criteria. They now also have a new one um, that has just been published that gives an, a lot of um, different weighting for these different symptoms. But again, it's a matter of if you have um, enough of the criteria uh, to be classified as systemic lupus. But many patients with lupus will have a positive ANA, have arthritis and photosensitivity, but may not have enough criteria to fulfill the diagnosis of lupus. Uh, another disease criteria is dermatomyositis or polymyositis. Uh, and again, these are uh, old criteria, these are from 1975. You had to have muscle weakness, elevated uh, muscle enzymes, have changes on uh, tests on the EMG, have characteristic muscle biopsies, or a typical rash of dermatomyositis. And again, many patients don't have enough criteria uh, to be classified as dermatomyositis. And then rheumatoid arthritis has a similar weighting for the type of joint involvement and type of um, blood tests, serology that they have. And again, many patients have arthritis, but don't meet the criteria for rheumatoid arthritis. So we all know about these different serologic blood tests. These are all the blood tests that your doctors do to try to sort out what exactly is going on. So the ANA is one of the most important tests in all of our um, uh, armamentarium of diagnostic tests. And it's important how, you, how the test is done. Um, it should be what we call an um, immunofluorescent test. So you can get both a pattern of the ANA, whether it's centromere, whether it's homogeneous or speckled, uh, as well as a titer, whether it's 1 to 80, 1 to 640, 1 to 2,500. 
Other tests include the sedimentation rate, the CRP, uh, arthritis tests are the rheumatoid factor, then the very specific tests for rheumatoid arthritis, CCP. We do muscle enzymes, including CPK and aldolase. Um, the tests for lupus are anti-DNA, anti-SM, and complements. And then the Sjogren's antibodies are SSA and SSB. But these uh, antibodies are actually seen in many connective tissue disease and can be nonspecific and do not necessarily associate with Sjogren's uh, syndrome. So you can understand when we have all these different um, uh, antibodies and tests that uh, the doctors have to use to interpret, as well as all the symptoms that you all have um, that make it challenging for the diagnosis to be made. So here are the scleroderma specific antibodies. And these have always been very helpful to try to sort out uh, whether um, a patient has a specific type of scleroderma and what um, organ involvement they might have. The SCL70 or topoisomerase is sort of the classic one for diffuse scleroderma. Anti-RNA polymerase 3 is the other one that's almost exclusively seen in diffuse cutaneous disease. And anti-centromere antibody is the one that's seen almost exclusively in limited cutaneous disease and which many doctors still call Crest syndrome. And then we have these antibodies that are associated with overlap sy syndromes, such as U1 RNP. And this is the mix, the classic mixed connective tissue disease. The other autoantibodies um, tend to be what we call nucleolar patterns. And they often have myositis associated with them, more arthritis or more lupus symptoms. And so they tend to be in the overlap category. So there's one issue that we uh, do need to discuss. There are some commercial uh, autoantibodies that use a method that's much cheaper to do and uh, is automated so you don't have to look at it under the microscope, um, but it's also very inaccurate. Uh, so there are frequently false positives, meaning that the antibodies are, quote, present, but when you do a true immunofluorescent ANA, the ANA is really negative. And that's very confusing for patients because they'll get told they have an anti-SCL70, they, that they have scleroderma. And yet when they see a, a, a rheumatologist or a scleroderma expert, uh, they really don't have any symptoms and they have a negative ANA. And that holds true for the U1 RNP, this mixed connective tissue disease, uh, antibody as well. In order for that to be a real positive, the ANA really has to be a very high titer um, as it should be in all patients with um, the scleroderma specific antibodies. There are also false negatives because because in this particular commercial assay, it only has certain antibodies. So it doesn't include some of these nucleolar antibodies. It doesn't include the uh, our, uh, you, the RNA polymerase 3 antibodies. And so it will say that your ANA is negative, and yet you really do have some scleroderma specific antibodies. So that's a very challenging uh, problem that we have to deal with. Fortunately, there is a new scleroderma panel uh, using a different approach, using a line blot uh, test that, that very specifically measures um, scleroderma antibodies. Um, it also has some false positives and false negatives, but it, it is it does seem to be um, uh, more accurate than this direct ANA. So we're going to go through some of the features that are seen in patients with mixed connective and undifferentiated connective tissue disease. And I think you'll see how common that they uh, can be and, and how frequently they look like totally similar to scleroderma. So Raynaud's is the most common symptom. And really in all of these disease, they're all the same. Um, it may only be mild and not prominent, um, but it usually is persistent. 
uh, and occurs throughout the whole illness. It can be severe with digital ulcers and difficult to manage just like it can be in scleroderma. Uh, another interesting phenomenon is these nail fold capillaries. I'm sure many of you have had uh, your rheumatologist look at your nails and you're always wondering what they're looking at. Well, these are little tiny capillaries right at the, the base of the nail bed. Uh, and we look at these with a little magnifying glass and try to find whether you have dilated capillaries or corkscrew capillaries or loss of capillaries. And these are very typical features that occur in scleroderma, can occur in myositis, and certainly can occur in mixed connective tissue disease. Uh, these digital ulcers um, can be very severe, just like they can be in scleroderma. Um, but patients with lupus can have digital ulcers as well. And those are usually from inflammation in the blood vessels. So sometimes it's a little hard to separate um, if you have a patient that has features of lupus as well as scleroderma, whether the digital ulcers are from typical vasculopathy of scleroderma or inflammation of the blood vessels. And um, that's why we sometimes have to use an arteriogram. And what that is, is where you put dye into the artery and then look at the actual blood vessels and see whether there's inflammation or whether there's blockage and decreased blood supply to the fingers. Um, in general, most of the time in scleroderma and in mixed connective tissue disease with the decreased blood supply to the fingers, we treat with blood dilators rather than steroids, which would be used for inflammation of the blood vessels. Arthritis in MCTD is very common, um, but it really has to be inflammation and not just joint pain. And inflammation means swelling or stiffness in the morning in the fingers lasting for more than an hour. Um, again, most commonly in the finger joints, maybe the toe joints and the knees. It responds very nicely to anti-inflammatory drugs like naproxen, ibuprofen, Celebrex. We often use Plaquenil, which is a very common drug and lupus, um, as well as methotrexate, which is one of our most common drugs for all arthritis, uh, inflammatory arthritis. Um, there are some unique features in uh, mixed connective tissue disease. Um, that make it look more like scleroderma. Even though the, in lupus, arthritis um, can be deforming, um, mostly because it affects the ligaments, they don't usually have holes in the bones or erosions. Um, but in mixed connective tissue disease and in scleroderma, you can have erosions or holes in the bones as shown by this arrow here. And also, just like in scleroderma, you can have calcinosis. This is extra calcium around the joint, the ends of the fingers, uh, et cetera. And then also in mixed connective tissue disease, um, similar to scleroderma, you can have resorption or loss of the tuft of the bone where the finger at the ends of the fingers get much shorter and it looks like you just have stubby little fingers at the tips of the fingers. And this may not have been at all related to where you've had ulcers or sores from rados, but we think it's probably from decreased blood supply because of the, the problem in the blood vessels in the fingers. And that's called acroosteolysis, breaking up of the bone. This deformity that happens in the fingers related to the Ligaments is very similar to what happens in lupus, um, and that has a long fancy name uh, called Jacoud's arthritis um, after the man who de uh, described it. Muscle involvement in MCTD is rarely the major presenting symptom, um, but if present, it often occurs early in the disease and is very similar on biopsy to that seen in dermatomyositis. But fortunately, usually the muscle enzymes, the CPK is not usually as high. And often the patient is totally asymptomatic. 
Um, they, they have just this very increase in the CPK, but they aren't weak. Um, and often it does not progress and may not need even any treatment. However, there are a few cases that have very severe weakness, which of course then requires high doses of prednisone, methotrexate, or intravenous immunoglobulins. The skin rashes, um, which uh, are very common in lupus, are much less common in MCTD. However, they're similar to the typical cutaneous rashes in lupus, um, but they also can have all the similar vascular changes that we see in scleroderma as well. When you do a biopsy in lupus rashes, there's a very characteristic immunological feature called the lupus band. It's immunofluoresces the, the certain uh, layer of the tissue on the skin biopsy. And interestingly, in mixed connective tissue disease, even though the rash looks like lupus, this lupus band test is uncommon. Um, more commonly in MCTD, we see the puffy fingers and skin thickening, which may take years for the, the patients to develop. Um, and it often is much more subtle and often missed by general rheumatologists. Um, but Certainly when a scleroderma rheumatologist will look at these patients, they'll be able to notice that there's actual skin thickening on the fingers. Gastrointestinal involvement in MCTD is very similar to scleroderma. Uh, gastrointestinal reflex disease, GERD, is very common. But GERD is very common in normal people, and it's really hard to distinguish the symptoms of GERD from the uh, problems that causes it. So esophageal dysmotility with dilation of the uh, esophagus and decreased motility um, is almost identical to what occurs in scleroderma. Um, again, another similar feature to scleroderma. Another major problem in MCTD, which does not usually occur in lupus is interstitial lung disease. And this is probably one of the biggest um, problems in the early diagnosis of MCTD is that because they're often originally diagnosed with lupus and the rheumatologist isn't looking for interstitial lung disease, the disease is missed and often isn't detected until it's very severe. Uh, one study actually found that 66% of patients had some evidence of interstitial lung disease. That's not a whole lot different than scleroderma, which is somewhere between 70 and 80% have some evidence. But fortunately, it's not severe. Um, many are, patients are treated with steroids because they think they have lupus, um, but really most people need the immunosuppressive agents. And then as the disease progress, they have more fibrosis. And along with their scleroderma findings, they really look like scleroderma and they really should be treated with scleroderma and not with steroids. So there's a new sort of diagnosis that goes along with this um, uh, undifferentiated connective tissue disease. It's when patients have features of interstitial lung disease, but don't really fit any criteria for a connective tissue disease like we talked about earlier in the talk. Um, they often have Raynaud's or joint disease. They often have positive ANAs. Uh, but again, having interstitial pneumonitis um, is very important to be identified. And oftentimes it's not uh, uh, looked for because the patient isn't very symptomatic early on. And it's only after the disease has become more severe um, that um, it is uh, identified. Other patients may have pulmonary arterial hypertension um, or heart involvement, or some patients have pleurisy, which is the chest pain when you take a deep breath. Um, similar uh, inflammation around the lining of the heart uh, or uh, rhythm problems of the heart. There, any organ really can be uh, involved. 
Um, fortunately, most patients do not have the serious kidney involvement of scleroderma or the kidney involvement of lupus. And most of these are rarely early manifestations. So the treatment of overlap syndromes, mixed connective tissue disease and UCTD are really treatment of the symptoms in the organs, no matter what disease um, they are said to have. So if you have lupus and you have severe interstitial disease, um, you treat the interstitial disease. Raynaud's joints and skin rashes are all treated with the medications that we use for those things. Uh, the main difference I think here is that uh, steroids um, are not very helpful in MCTD for the interstitial lung disease. And we really need to use more potent immunosuppressive medicines like we use in scleroderma. So the course and the outcome of MCTD is, is really quite different in patients. But most typically, I think the patient presents with active lupus findings, arthritis, skin rash, um, those types of things. They're found to have an ANA and they're called lupus. Um, but they almost always have uh, Raynaud's at that time. And then as the, many of the lupus symptoms are quieted down, um, then they have more problems with the scleroderma manifestations, which unfortunately really do not uh, resolve like a lot of the lupus manifestations. And they just have what looks like typical scleroderma. Less commonly, um, patients that started out with say scleroderma and lupus manifestations will later develop lupus symptoms or a vasculitis or inflammation of the heart or something quite unusual, but this is really quite rare, but that's why it's important to keep remembering that the patient has mixed connective tissue disease. So you think of some of those other things that happen. But as I mentioned, scleroderma symptoms always seem to persist. So what is MCTD? There's been argument throughout the 50 years that we've been dealing with this uh, entity and is it a totally separate disease from scleroderma lupus or myositis? Um, the antibody is not only present in just patients with mixed connective tissue disease. Some people have U1RMP and have pure lupus or have pure scleroderma without any overlapping features. Um, and the antibody doesn't cause the disease. We know that the, the disease doesn't, these antibodies aren't, aren't the cause of the disease, they're markers of disease. Um, they don't have any distinct features. They're all features of all these other diseases. And not everything responds to steroids, unfortunately, like they initially thought. All, all the scleroderma features certainly don't respond to steroids. So then the question is, is it all just lupus? Um, but there are differences here. As we talked about, the lupus skin um, is, is, even though it's not as common, it, it usually has a negative lupus band test. These patients have an erosive, uh, erosive joint disease, um, but they don't usually have the CCP, which is the rheumatoid arthritis uh, specific antibody. They don't usually have lupus brain involvement or lupus kidney involvement. And the lupus features really decrease with time. And they also rarely have um, the more serious antibodies that do cause problems like anti-DNA or phospholipid antibodies. So we really don't think that MCTD is just lupus. Um, and is it really a mixed disease? Um, not really a mixed disease either because it's not really lupus. It's not really typical muscle disease. Um, the, as we mentioned, the arthritis is not associated with CCP, the antibody, but the scleroderma features that are in these patients are really all the same as in regular scleroderma uh, patients. And so I really think that this mixed connective tissue disease, a 
associated with U1 RNP is really a subset of scleroderma. So the scleroderma features in MCTD, as we've talked about, raynodes, digital ulcers, puffy fingers, skin thickening, other telangiectasias, calcinosis, typical dysmotility of the GI tract, interstitial lung disease, pulmonary hypertension, rarely scleroderma renal uh, crisis occurs, but fortunately that's rare in many. But these are all features that we see in, in many scleroderma features. Um, other features, inflammatory arthritis. Now many of our scleroderma patients can have arthritis. They can have um, bony erosions or holes in the bones and even can have CCP in patients that have scleroderma. They can certainly have inflammation in the muscles associated with some of these autoantibodies. Rarely, but occasionally we see inflammation around the lining of the lung um, or the heart. Um, and uncommonly we see some of these other features. So uh, again, I really think that U1 is part of this, all of these scleroderma autoantibodies and is a part of scleroderma and should be thought of as being scleroderma. So in conclusion, Overlap disease, mixed connective tissue disease are terms to use to describe scleroderma-like illnesses that do not only meet criteria for scleroderma. The inflammatory features, particularly early on, may need to be treated with steroids, but one should not assume that all aspect of the disease needs or responds to steroids. Scleroderma features are most common throughout the course of the illness. And we really need to watch for the severe complications of pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension.